Well, hi everyone. Uh, welcome. This is the second uh, series of sort of mini lectures on introducing pure data. This week we're going to be looking at digital audio uh, sampling and processing. So we're going to start off in this first uh, little video talking talking about digital audio, talking about sampling, so you've got a sense of what that means, and talking about some concepts around sampling like quantizing and so on. Then in future videos, we're going to go in and look at some basic building blocks of digital audio, um, uh, like oscillators, for example, and look at some very at some basic synthesis, basic approaches to audio synthesis using pure data. Okay, so let's jump into this. So um, to start with, we need to have some understanding of what sound actually is. Um, so sound is a wave generated by vibrating objects in air. Um, if you think of a guitar string, for example, when you pluck a guitar string, that guitar string vibrates back and forwards uh, very rapidly, and in vibrating it compresses the, the air molecules that are surrounding it. Um, and the movement of it, these, this movement of air molecules radiates out from the string, and the the, those compressed, uh, those sort of vibrations in the air molecules cause your uh, eardrums to vibrate in sympathy. So your eardrums vibrate um, in the same sort of way that the guitar string uh, vibrates, uh, and that is detected by your your body and your brain, and uh, that's how you kind of detect and 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 perceive sound. So if sound is really just air molecules moving backwards and forwards. Um, and if, if those, that, those movements are um, kind of regular and periodic, then we'll hear a pitch sound. Um, so the cha these changes in air pressure that, uh, that you, the guitar string is causing or that any other um, sound is causing, any other sort of sound source is causing, can be tracked with a microphone. And what a microphone has within it, there's different kinds of microphones that we don't really need to go into, but ultimately, somewhere inside the microphone, there is a little um, membrane of some kind that moves backwards and forwards as the air pressure around it changes. And if what the microphone does really is translate these movements, these back and forwards movements, into electrical signals that we can then um, track and record. So if we track and record um, a bit of the movement of a microphone membrane and sort of graph its position, um, we can draw it. And when we do that, uh, we get um, uh, a drawing of the, the vibration that the, that the microphone membrane is undergoing. And that might look something like this. So here's an example of a, a waveform recording of some sound. And what that, if you think about it, all this is really doing is showing us the position of the microphone membrane over time. So the x-axis here is time, and the y-axis is the position of the microphone membrane at particular um, moments in time. Okay, so that's a very simplistic description of what sound is, the, you know, move, vibrating air molecules. Um, and it's a description of how a microphone works and that it has a little membrane that moves backwards and forwards. It has a little membrane that moves backwards and forwards um, and it converts those movements into an electrical signal. Um, so that electrical signal is an analog phenomenon. It's, um, we just have this you know, flow of electrons. It's an, uh, uh, an electrical signal that we work with. And we somehow or other, because computers work with numbers, we need to convert... Um, that analog phenomenon, that electrical signal that's come from the movement of the microphone, we need to convert that into numbers so the computer can work with it. So to represent, uh, yes, to, to represent these real world or analog features like sound, like the, like the movement of the microphone membrane or like that electrical signal, we need to somehow or other measure them. And the process of taking measurements involves um, sampling and quantizing. So we're going to look at what that actually means. And to get a sense of what sampling is, we're going to use this very simple YouTube video that I tracked down of a pendulum swinging. So let me play you the video to start with. 
get rid of all this other rubbish then. So here's the video. When I play it, you see a little ping pong ball or something suspended on the end of a little string there and it's released and then it sways backwards and forwards. So our goal is to reproduce this movement in the computer to a certain degree of precision. And if we want to reproduce this pendulum movement in a processing sketch, for example, we're going to need to measure the position of the pendulum over time. So we can see that when it starts, when the video starts, if I go back to the beginning, when the video starts, let me make myself a little bit smaller, make this a bit bigger, or a bit, just arrange the desktop a bit. When the video starts, the pendulum is all the way over on the left hand side here. And what we're going to want to do is translate this, um, this analog phenomenon, this movement of a pendulum, which, well, it's already been digitized because it's on YouTube, but let's, let's say it's an analog <laughs> phenomenon. So we have, a, uh, we have the pendulum. What we're going to do is convert the position of this pendulum into a series of numbers. And if we um, then draw a, a circle in our processing sketch, based on those numbers, we should be able to somehow, we, we should be able to reproduce the movement of this pendulum. So what we're going to do is make a note of the position of the ball every second. So we say, okay, well, every, at position, at second zero, the position of this ball is uh, let's see if I can bring up the position of this ball is it's about 290 pixels or 291 pixels um, from the left of the screen. So we might say that our first measured position of the x coordinate of this um, ball is 290. So we would write down okay first sample 290 And then we're going to fast forward the video to one second. And in one second, the ball is moved from over here to over here. And the x coordinate now is 1297 or thereabouts of the position of that ball. So 1297 would be our second sample of the x coordinate of that ball. And if I then move to second, uh, two seconds into the video, uh, you can see you can see that getting accurate measurements with YouTube is tricky. But um, if we move to the to um, a point two seconds into the video, now the ball is at uh, fourteen hundred and seventy-seven. One four seven seven is our x coordinate for the ball. So I would write that down, 1477. 
Now, to keep things simple, I'm only looking at the X coordinate for now. We could obviously sample the X and Y coordinates. I'm only doing X just to keep it simple. Um, and I also know that with, if I'm gonna write a processing sketch, I don't actually need to, um, if I know the X coordinate, I can sort of figure out the Y coordinate because um, based on the previous sketches we've done in class, we kind of know we can do our, um, our arithmetic using our year rate maths and our um, sine and cosine to, to figure out the Y coordinate if I know the X coordinate. So, so that's, that's the reason I'm only using, I'm only sampling X here. But hopefully you can see that what I'm doing is I'm building up, I'm measuring the position of this ball once a second and assigning a number to it. So I'm assigning a number to the position of this ball based on its X coordinate. And you could imagine I could continue on and sample again at three seconds, four seconds, five seconds, six seconds, and, and so on. I can do that every second, um, well, until the end of the video. So that is sampling. That is taking an analog phenomenon, the movement of that pendulum, and assigning, and, and at various um, predefined time points, assigning a value to its position. Now, what I've actually done is I have a little processing sketch where I've put in some sampled values from that YouTube video. In order to sort of um, make the example a bit more concrete, so up here I measured the the, the x positions of the pendulum. I did it with a smaller window, so the numbers aren't as big as the ones we were getting. I wasn't using full screen, but I so I sampled them um, once every second up here, and I've created an array with those x positions in it. And I've just written some very simple code down in here to place a, um, a circle on the screen um, at the appropriate X coordinate. And I've calculated the Y coordinate based on the pendulum length. Um, and what I've said is that I want to draw one frame every second. So in our draw, our draw method, which is normally, as you know, called 60 times a second. Um, in this uh, example, it's only going to be called once per second. So I've sampled the pendulum movement once per second, um, and then therefore to play it back somewhat accurately within the limits of that very coarse um, once per second measurements, to play it back as accurately as I can based on those samples, I'm going to need to play it back once per second. I sampled it once per second, I need to play it back once per second. So let's have a look at what that looks like. There you go. So you get a sense there that with 10 samples, one per, I only did 10 samples, I was only doing 10 seconds. Um, with 10 samples, we get some sense of the movement of that pendulum. Not a very accurate sense of it, but some sense at least. Let's just run it again so you can pick that up. So you get some sense that, that there's periodic movement going on here, I guess, from looking at this, pen, looking at this pendulum. So I thought, okay, well, that's pretty cool. Maybe if I try doing, doubling the number of measurements, to get more accuracy, because I can see that if I'm only sampling once, if I'm only sampling once every second, I'm not really getting a particularly accurate view of what the movement of that actual of that pendulum in reality. So, well, what about I double the number of samples I take, and instead of taking one per second, let's take two per second, and see if we get a better fidelity result. So, I did that. You'll have to take my word for it. I went through and tried to sample twice a second on this YouTube video of the, the X coordinate of the um, pendulum. And then I've plugged those numbers into here. Let's run that and see how that looks. Oh, but one other thing I need to do. I need to change the frame rate. So before, because I was sampling at one, one 
um, once per second. Um, I needed to play back once per second, but now I'm sampling twice per second, so let's play back um, at double the rate so that we have the same, uh, we're, still, we're still talking about 10 seconds of this pe of pendulum movement. Okay, so we're starting to get a slug, some of the gaps are sort of starting to get filled in. We're getting a richer picture of the movement of that pendulum now as I have doubled the sampling rate. And of course, let's just run it again to, to show you. Of course, it's still pr pretty approximate. But you can hopefully get the concept that I could continue and double our sampling rate again and take four samples per second and then eight and 16 and, and I could continue on and on and on. And each time that I would increase the number of samples I'm taking, I would increase the accuracy with which um, our um, playback would reflect the original. So when it comes to sampling, sampling is essentially measuring something. Um, in this case, it was the pendulum, but when we're talking about digital audio, we're really sort of sampling the, the, the movement of air or the movement of a microphone membrane, which is sort of, which is affected by the movement of air. So sampling is measuring, and there's a few questions that arise. One is how often do you sample, which we've just been talking about then in relation to that pendulum but also how accurately do we measure? If you think about it, if we stick a pencil down next to a ruler to measure its length, we can measure it to various degrees of precision. We could say, oh yeah, well it's seven centimeters or it's seven and a quarter centimeters. Or you could zoom right in and look really carefully at the ruler and say, oh well yeah, it's 7.12345, 7.6 centimeters or, or whatever. And we could continue zooming in to that ruler and get our measurements more and more accurate. So we go, well, 7. Point, okay, in this case, 7.25 centimeters, 7.254, 7.2542. You could continue zooming in and zooming in, adding more decimals after the decimal point to get higher and higher accuracy. Um, and obviously, the greater the accuracy they have, the higher the fidelity um, uh, of, your, of your samples, but the more data is required. So if you think that instead of measuring a pencil, we're measuring the position of a microphone membrane, or we're measuring the, the, the voltage of a, of a signal that's coming out of a microphone, um, the greater the accuracy we have when we measure, the more high quality and accurate the sound that we're going to reproduce um, is going to be. But of course that takes more data. So the process of assigning a number to a measurement is known as quantizing and depending on how accurate, on the accuracy, uh, yeah, and, th and that affects the accuracy of, um, of, of, your, uh, of, the, of the recording of whatever it is you're, you're sampling. Um, so the precision of the sample is determined by the bit depth. I think this is a fairly obvious point, perhaps I don't really need to make, but you know, we, we should be able to see that if we're increasing our accuracy to uh, uh, if we're increasing our accuracy, we're going to need more bits inside the computer to store that figure. So if you have only one bit that you're using to store um, samples, well, you've only got zero or one. That's not very useful. If you've got two bits, you've got four values, and eight bits, you've got two fifty six. You've got sixteen bits, you've got sixty five thousand. 536 values and so on and so on. So more bits gives you more numbers uh, which gives you greater accuracy. Um, and really I've already talked about this but um, I've talked about this in relation to the pendulum example before but if we if what we're measuring is changing um, if, you're, if you're measuring um, sound, um, sound changes over time. So the, the movement of the microphone changes over time. If, this, if what we're measuring is the movement of the microphone, that will change over time. And we need to decide how often we're going to measure it. 
just like with the pendulum, we just we first up started measuring its position once a second, and then um, increased that to be twice a second. Um, this is a decision we need to make. And the more often you sample, the more accurate your measurements are going to be. Um, so if you use a higher sampling rate, if you sample more times per second, then you're going to get greater fidelity to your source. You're going to need more storage. You're going to have higher processing requirements if you're doing things with those samples once you've, once you've recorded them. Um, and to put it in a nutshell, these days, practically speaking, there is no reason not to record at at least 44 kilohertz, that is 44,000 times a second, using 16-bit samples. So that, that is CD quality. So those of you that remember compact discs, that were an old phenomenon that came out before vinyl came back. Um, so the CDs, the sort of the definition for compact disc recording was uh, 44,000 samples a second, 16-bit um, um, precision. And in your assignments um, and anything you do really with digital audio, um, there's no reason these days to use anything less than that. Um, computers, storage capacity and processing capacity is now at a point where um, it's unnecessary to try and um, scrimp, um, scrimp and save to sort of reduce data. It's just, um, when it comes to audio, it's not really an issue anymore. Okay, so that's all I wanted to talk about in relation to um, the basic concept of sampling and how we move from something, some analog phenomenon like the movement of a guitar string or the movement of a pendulum and how we take that and convert it into a stream of numbers that we can then do things with in the computer. So once we have um, an analog phenomenon like sound or like the movement of a pendulum in a computer, uh, we can manipulate it in our processing sketches or in our pure data patches and we can change that sound or we can uh, reproduce the movement of a pendulum or we can mess with sound and process it and change a sound to be um, to add effects to it, to add reverb, for example, or other kinds of audio effects. But all those cool things we can do with it in the computer are all predicated on us converting that analog phenomenon into numbers. So it's quite an important um, concept to understand. And when we're talking about digital audio in pure data, we're talking about a big stream of numbers that are just describing the position of a, in, in essence, they're describing the position of a microphone membrane uh, over time. So that's it. Um, next up, we're going to talk about digital audio in pure data.